Yes, thank you, uh, Philip, and many thanks for inviting me and uh, to, to the organizers that you have set up this uh, conference. I'm very happy to be here. And now, after the impressive pictures by Keller, you are confronted now with many uh, letters and sentences. Um, I'm now in Vienna, and Philip already um, explained the reasons. I'll move in 10 days or 10 months to Berlin. I'll work there, hopefully, on a new book on global social ecological transformations and the global Green New Deal or the Green New Deal. So I hope that we have a chance to meet uh, in person and to discuss uh, some further stuff. When I um, started to think about my presentation, um, I went back to some material on scale and space I collected many years ago, and I found in my folders many articles written by Eric Swingerdo. Um, I found um, a workshop which we organized with Susanne Heeg, Roger Kai, Bernd Berliner, some of you might know, and even my habilitation talk uh, was called New Spaces of State Politics back in 2006. And we tried then to spatialize the globalization debate, a critique of the very prominent concept at this time, which was multi-level governance and the critical uh, scale debates um, went far beyond this. The debate on post fordism the crisis of post fordism and its power-shaped restructuring. And this, I'm a political scientist, work in, in international political economy, international politics, so the, the, the politics of scale debate at this time was very important um, uh, for us. However, uh, having gone through this material and uh, listening to your, the, the introductory speeches yesterday, and I learned that you did such a great work on a complex, uh, to, to, um, to have these, um, complexify these uh, debates, uh, I um, don't bore you with considerations on place, space, or scale from a, from a humble political scientific perspective. But um, I would like to reflect a bit in 20, 25 minutes on the relationship between spatial refigurations and the imperial mode of living. I, I switch the title from of the imperial mode of living to and. So I hope that also I get feedback from you and that, as I said, we will have a chance to to discuss this um, further. There's an interesting coincidence with Keller's perspective, which um, I find uh, I want to emphasize right at the beginning. At the end of our book from 2017, Imperial Mode of Living in German, it was published this year in English and also in nine other languages. We are very happy, also in Chinese and Korean and Japanese and other languages. Um, and our final chapter is what we call, we is Markus Wissen, a friend and colleague of mine and me, a solidary mode of living. And um, we look also at concrete experiences um, on search processes, and we deny, in a sense, also a master plan. And I found Keller's thoughts quite interesting. Um, we outline some principles, some achievements. Markus Wiss and I, we come also very much from the Alta globalization movement. Um, but um, I think it's quite important to, to state and to say that, that we don't have currently a clear-cut alternative. However, and this is then, um, I outline uh, a brief outline of my talk, uh, the motivation of my research. I will uh, um, then talk about this, however, wh what I'm interested in. Then I will um, start um, by identifying three diverse scenarios of a future of how to cope with the crises and that these are contested. And then I will delve into two of them. Both of them claim to contribute to social ecological transformations. I understood your um, your invitation like that, that I should make a bit sense of this quite fancy debate on social ecological transformations. And then um, um, in, the, in the next step, I would outline the concept of imperial mode of living, which is not imperial mode of life, but, but um, it's, um, it's a structural concept. I will outline it briefly. And then after the debate um, yesterday with Walter Milono and, other, and others, I would like to ask and insist as an hypothesis that we should um, look particularly at one scale, which is still the nation state, and that the nation state for theoretical reasons, but also what we can observe empirically plays still a major role. And then at the end, I have some open questions. So my motivation is that uh, the, the question I am um, dealing with since many years, um, why despite the high politicization of the ecological crisis, it's so difficult to reach profound changes. And that the 
main dynamics we can observe is what I call with others the dynamics towards a green capitalism in the global north with enormous costs um, in the global south, enormous costs because it does not stop the destruction of nature, but also costs within the global north. And then I'm also interesting, I won't tackle this here, um, what we call the solidarity mode of living, but what are the contradictions, the contestations of this dominant dynamics? And I took from your, from your um, research center um, some questions, points you're interested in, and I come back to this at the end, and I hope that I can contribute a little bit to um, prepare some, um, some uh, answers. So you, you want to make the conflictual transformation processes more tangible. You want to enable a better understanding of underlying dynamics for shape new conflicts and challenges and how conflicts manifest themselves in, among others, decision-making and flows across globally connected societies. I'm sorry for the mistake. I'm also sorry for the mistakes in my abstract in the, in the program. Um, so um, I go now through what I announced, and at the end, I try to sum up a bit, um, yeah, to, to present some um, answers to these, no, tentative thoughts, answers to this question. So my first thought. Um, if we condense as a, in a thought experiment, of course, there are many, many um, uh, gray zones uh, uh, among them, um, different strate strategies, different responses to, to the multiple crisis. I come from a neo Gramscian perspective, um, and, um, um, which thinks also in projects that there are political, social, economic projects around which uh, dominant actors organize themselves to pursue their interests, we can distinguish, probably more, but I, for this, um, for this uh, talk, we can distinguish three. There is an anti-ecological business as usual in more or less authoritarian versions. We saw in Keller's uh, um, uh, presentation, the famous hairs of uh, one of the protagonists of this anti-ecological business as usual project or, um, or scenarios. I won't deal with it, but then I want to outline two different projects that claim to um, contribute to social ecological transformations and to deal with the deepening multiple crisis, particularly the, 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 the climate crisis. The first social ecological transformation is what we can call, um, um, with Nancy Fraser, progressive neoliberalism in a mode of ecological modernization without questioning the capitalist social forms. And we can call it an emerging green capitalism in the global north with the costs I already mentioned. And a second form of social ecological transformation is really to deal with the capitalist and post-colonial root causes of crisis, what we might call a solidary uh, mode of production and living. And this distinction, I would say, is mirrored in a very hot debate, which started uh, about 10 years ago uh, um, at the end of the, of the financial and economic crisis around 2008, 2009, where obviously the debate on sustainable development, sustainability proved to be not radical enough, pre proved to, be, to, to go not beyond the state of the art, despite the negotiations of the sustainable development goals. So an, a, a debate started um, on transformation and the very semantics of transformation, of course, is more radical than change or development and the transformation is also the semantical, semantic um, um, reference to Karl Polanyi's great transformation. So um, the, the, there is a fundamental change needed. I went in a literature review um, um, during some uh, years uh, through the literature and detected some common ground. And I would say that this idea of a fundamental change that go, which goes beyond incremental change is um, at the core of the transformation debate. The focus is mainly on the energy basis away from fossil fuels. We are quite familiar with this, that the resource basis in general also should be uh, used in different ways. It should um, that we use less and in a more efficient way. The, the claim for the greening of markets, green jobs, green investments, and green, uh, green growth. And in the mainstream of the literature, I come back to this distinction in a moment, 
there is a lot of trust in the change of values already towards sustainability. And against the neoliberal dogma at this time, it's politics stupid, the phrase in the famous um, um, uh, report for the German government that the state and the global system should regulate. So in the debate, and I think this was really new, there, there was a far reaching guidance. Remember that in 2007, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, published its fourth report with really alarming uh, uh, results how the, um, the climate crisis um, uh, uh, developed. However, despite this far reaching diagnosis and aims, the concrete steps in the largest, larger part of the transformation debate were not adequately radical. It was, there was a lot of trust, as I said, in institutions, in values, and the focus was much more on the change of resources, of the energy base, of fossil fuels, and not so much of the capitalist social forms, of the capitalist growth imperative and others. And there was, in much literature, what I call a political strategic overload, that um, because um, the debate should um, um, should um, um, influence, uh, politicians should influence the public debate. There was a kind of um, a claim, we need this, and the, an the analysis was kind of a bit cut there. I called this in an article published in, uh, five years ago in Gaia, um, a new critical orthodoxy. There was something new and critical, but the orthodox of the mainstream social ecological transformation gave us that, okay, we know now how it goes, that we have to change the energy basis, the, the resource base, but within the social forms, within the growth uh, imperative. So to sum up this first part, I propose that we should distinguish within the debate on social ecological transformation, a more mainstream understanding, as I said, a radical diagnosis, but then proposing incremental change, pro-market, pro-state, pro-existing power relations, and as a colleague um, once said, the protagonists of the social ecological transformation debate want to be listened by the power. And this should be distinguished from a more critical and emancipatory understanding of social ecological transformation as in, in the sense of search processes, uh, Keller was also uh, referring to that the radical diagnosis of deepening ecological and multiple crises needs requires analytically, but then also politically, uh, in political initiatives by social movements, by, uh, by uh, radical actors, a rethinking and remaking of existing capitalist social forms, the, 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 the value form and the, the, the commodity form, the commodification processes. Keller also was referring to uh, the related power relations and the related North-South relations, the imperial character of um, of uh, globalizing capital. So in the next step, I want to um, introduce briefly, some of you already might know the concept or have um, heard it, um, the concept of imperial mode of living, the imperial mode of production and living. And um, what um, Markus Wissen and me motivated to develop the, um, the concept, among other things, is why the liberal, the, the first version of social ecological transformation of ecological organization is still predominant. Why for, for, for the, the, the dominant actors, it's kind of the, the obvious um, path to take to change the resource basis, but not the, the social capitalist forms. And also why it's so difficult to achieve a more radical emancipatory and internationalist, internationalist perspective, which I, I want to insist again uh, um, uh, after the debates yesterday, it's not a homogeneous understanding of internationalism uh, emancipation and radical politics. It has to be. I work very much on Latin America. I spent three years of my life in Latin America, and I discuss there a, a lot. I'm very aware of the differences. So the main idea of the concept in pure mode of living and of production is that um, we want to understand both the persistence and the crisis deepening patterns of production and consumption. That consist or are based in um, on an in principle unlimited appropriation of resources, labor capacity of both the global north and the global south, which means, um, to be more, uh, more um, um, explicit and concrete, the production of cell phones, of cheap meat, 
of industrial of the products of industrial agriculture, the production of cars, of um, whatever, of clothes, requires the access to cheap labor and cheap nature in the global south, but also within the global north. When you think about um, um, the, the, the meat factories, which were so politicized in the coronavirus crisis uh, and others. So the imperial mode of living is a relational concept which tries to link the everyday life, which is not only the consumption, it's also the, the work, that people go to work, live, they work in a factory, they work in offices, they work uh, elsewhere, and to link this, these everyday practices, which are very often uh, unconscious, which are pra just practices, they are done, not because people are bad and want to, want to exploit others, that these are linked to the large social economic and political uh, structures. And we argue against the neoliberal, neoclassic mantra when the growth rates are high enough, everybody, everybody at the end will be better off. No, the, the, the imperial mode of living needs the other side of the coin, needs South China, needs the soybean uh, production in Brazil and India, needs um, open pit mining uh, all over the world, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we underline this this everyday aspect of capitalist uh, globalization or globality since, the co since colonialism, since the start of colonialism, but we are also aware that the making of the imperial mode of production and living has strategic, material, and also discursive dimensions. So the strategies of, the, of capital, of the private companies, the st strategies of state and public policies, if we think in free trade policies, um, next spring, we will have again a, a big debate on the EU, Mercosur, free trade agreement, etc. The neo-colonial politics and also our field, um, science and technology development is part of these strategies to, not explicitly, of course, but to contribute, in fact, to the making and remaking of the imperial mode of living, which, of course, in, 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 the, in the very concrete uh, manifests in, in, in various ways. It has the material dimensions, such as resources, built infrastructures, we just heard, heard this, emissions, we, it, it has to do with discourses of progress, good living, um, the growth imperative, uh, and others. But it has also to do, um, and I think this is our contribution, with these everyday practices, the habitualized, internalized um, forms of making, of having a good life, of making good, the aspirations, as I said yesterday, in the discussions and the discussion and the imperial mode of living in its very concrete forms. How do we live? How do we move? How do we communicate? What do we eat? How do we uh, um, um, live, uh, have houses, etc., etc.? These ways are always contested, as um, um, Eric already um, um, underlined yesterday. So the domination shape routinizing of the imperial mode of living goes hand in hand with temporal, spatial, uh, technical uh, fixes uh, all over the world. We argue that the imperial mode of living is within the, the process of capitalist globalization, of digitalization, of um, the enormous um, growth of, um, of the outreach of our activities when, when we consume, when we move, uh, etc., etc., that this imperial mode of living is deepened in the global north and enhanced mainly among the middle classes in the global south. We have, um, there is a Spanish version published in Buenos Aires in Argentina, the friends of mine, Tinta Limon, and publisher, and we have um, in, in, uh, as a foreword, the English version was published with Verso, and there we have a special foreword also in times of Corona crisis, but the foreword for the Spanish version is to reflect with, um, with colleagues, friends, comrades from Argentina and Brazil, how this concept can be translated uh, into very concrete contexts in the global uh, South, in this case in Latin America, and there are some interesting elements how, how these um, uh, assimilation processes are kind of um, integrated. Again, it has to do with capital strategies, with straight state strategies, but it also has to do with, a, with a, um, an everyday orientation and what is a good living and, and others. So I come to the end and want, um, listening to the debates yesterday and um, Martina's and other introduction, the first results of your, of your um, 
uh, research group um, uh, you detected and there are there is an enormous variety of spatial features. What I want to do maybe here as a humble uh, political scientist uh, um, coming from critical state theory, Nikos Poulantzas uh, and others, I would like to argue for this moment that despite the variety of spatial figures and of scales, we should look particularly, not exclusively, of course, this I hope became clear with my, with my first thoughts, um, particularly at the nation state, because the nation state remains the crucial scale where capital, capital organizes its reproduction politically through laws, coercion, free trade policies, uh, we saw in the next, in the last uh, 20 um, months um, um, in crisis situations and others. Of course, we have um, what um, Stephen Gill um, um, 20 years or even more uh, um, ago called a global constitutionalism. There is the WTO, there are the processes to, to um, have a global capitalist constitution to secure property rights, intellectual property rights and others. What Quinn Slobod in his fantastic book, Globalists, um, called the Geneva School of Neoliberalism. So this, this global scale is also important, but I would argue that there are good reasons that um, particularly now in times of crisis, in times of rising conflicts, the national scale um, is, um, um, remains important and maybe gains it. This, the nation, nation state is also crucial to organize global capitalist competition and the compromises among the classes. So the Imperial mode of living, which could be interpreted as a class compromise, or we interpret it as a class compromise. The welfare state is a class compromise at the cost of others, at the cost of nature. Um, and at this, in this sense, the nation state also remains um, um, crucial in organizing also the material well-being of those, of course, the class structure, gender, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a difference whether you live here in Vienna, in Austria, or you live um, um, 80 kilometers east in Hungary, in uh, Slovakia, or in Romania, in Bulgaria. So there is a strong tendency that the nation state disposes also over the resources to, um, to organize a certain well-being within, uh, within, within its territory. I don't, I don't argue in favor of a container state, of course, but I just want to highlight and for our debate that the nation state um, still plays um, an important role. And of course, um, below the nation state, the local uh, entities. So to, to finish, um, this is uh, uh, some open question that came to my mind after the debate um, yesterday. And um, one is that um, Walter uh, detects the de and re-westernization as a core dynamic. And you ask for the core dynamics also in your, um, in your research center. And yes, I, I agree with this, I, with the, with the um, reservation um, um, Eric and others put that we should not homogenize uh, the, 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 the regions. But I would add, and this is also part of my um, upcoming research, um, how the increasingly catastrophic effects of the ecological crisis, in particular the climate crisis, um, um, articulates with, um, with um, uh, the refigurations. So what does it mean that if you like, the conditions of our living together, of our societal organization and everyday lives are, um, uh, are worsening. So what does it mean if we have floods, drafts, uh, 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 and others? A second aspect, which was not so um, uh, in, uh, important yet for the debate, but I think it's pr quite um, uh, prominent in debates in within the, the uh, sustainability studies, political ecology, et cetera, Eric contributed to this as well, is the debate about the Anthropocene, the planetary boundaries. And my question would be here, is this a current form of universalizing thinking about the climate crisis? I put you on the slide an article I just published three months ago with um, 27 colleagues from 14 countries, where we try to criticize the very prominent debate on planetary boundaries and adding two concepts. The first is societal boundaries and uh, collectively defined self-limitation. So what, and, and I link it to Keller's point, what is the capacity of planetary solidarity under the conditions that we need to implement, particularly in the global north, certain forms of collectively defined self-limitation, which is not 
an individual choice. Yeah, don't get me wrong. It's not that we we say okay, let's consume less, but as a as a societal challenge, as a planetary challenge, to organize these um, self limitations. So how does this um, yeah articulate with your research? And um, the, the last question, of course, is um, as I already said. Um, when you accept that we can discuss it, when you accept the, the idea that the, the, the nation state still remains important, maybe gains importance in this new conflicts we are currently observing, what does it mean? So I end with um, some um, thoughts. It is, no, it's not answers, it's thoughts um, on your key questions. So you want to make uh, um, the conflictual transformation processes more tangible, then I think. Um, my work or Marcus and my work, we can contribute to um, to look at the struggles, the manifold struggles to maintain the imperial mode of living despite the high politicization of the ecological crisis. My interpretation of the German elections um, a month ago uh, was that uh, the, the Green Party and the leftist party, despite all the problems they had, they also did not win so much because um, the crisis, the, the, the recent crisis showed to many people that the challenges to deal with the crisis are enormous, are even not understood. And so we remain on the safe side of the, of the, of the world uh, within the environment of living and not looking so much on the, on the challenges. Um, the conflictual transformation should look at the increasing what we call eco-imperial tensions uh, over land, over resources, uh, over Glasgow starts um, uh, next Monday over the emissions, the rights to, emish, uh, to, to, to emit um, um, CO2 and other um, um, greenhouse, gases, greenhouse gases. And um, it's, I'm sorry for the mistakes again, it's not only, I would say, about knowing and sensing, as, as Walter argues, it's also, I would say, about the capitalist political economy, which is, which is beyond knowing and sensing. So to better understand the underlying dynamics, uh, Yes, I think we are in this uh, change of era of decoloniality and de-Westernization, but I would add um, one underlying dy dynamic is still the um, destructive societal nature relations. I'm sorry, I forgot nature, um, particularly the, the climate crisis. So it's the decoloniality and de-Westernization and re-Westernization cannot be understood, I think, without taking into consideration the worsening uh, um, uh, um, societal nature relations, the worsening climate crisis. And how conflicts manifest themselves, I would say that um, the conflicts manifest, but the conflicts are also dealt with, and the imperial mode of living is a form to compromise in the global north, but also among certain groups in the global south, but at the cost of others and at the cost of nature. Many conflicts are, in our view, externalized in time and space to secure the improvement of living. So the, the, the manifest conflict is the conflict about uh, large pit mining in uh, Peru or in uh, Ecuador. Uh, but the, the, the driver for this conflict is the demand from the automotive industry in, uh, in Europe. And again, um, that um, we have, uh, we should look also that when we take seriously this idea that the nation state is still an important scale, that many conflicts manifest internationally also at interstate rivalry and interstate power struggles. How global rules, how access to resources is organized, again, the imperial, uh, eco-imperial tensions. So far, many thanks for your attention.